Hello, my name is Charles Upton. Um, I'm going to read you a piece called The Model of Muslim Chivalry and the Virtues of the Prophet Muhammad. This is part of a uh, thing I put together called the Covenants of the Prophet Training Course. But in any case, this piece stands alone. So, I am presently associated with an international Muslim peace movement called the Covenants Initiative, whose mission is to tell the world about the covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the peoples of the book, in which our Prophet orders all Muslims not to kill or rob or oppress or damage the buildings of peaceful Christians, but rather to defend them until the end of time. Since Dr. John Andrew Morrow and I inaugurated the initiative in 2013, based on his book, The Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of the World, I begun to realize that what we are doing perfectly fits the definition of the Arabic word futuwa, which is usually translated into English as chivalry, and which some have defined as heroic generosity. Organized futuwa first made its appearance as an order of knighthood founded by the Abbasid Khalif al-Nasr al-Din Allah. Later, after the order was dissolved, it became associated with the craft guilds and exercised an important influence on Sufism. And though the greatest exemplar of Muslim chivalry per se is universally recognized as Ali ibn Abi Talib, all the virtues of chivalry are to be found in the character of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The following text is partly adapted from my book, The Virtues of the Prophet, A Young Muslim's Guide to the Greater Jihad, The War Against the Passions. It is a meditation on the character of Muhammad considered as the central tafsir, exegesis, of the Holy Quran, the Quran in human form. It has been said that Islam is the meeting between God as such and man as such. For the nature of God, we have the first part of the Shahada, I testify that there is no God but God. For the nature of man, because there can be no conception of who God is without a corresponding idea of what man is, we have the second half, and I testify that Muhammad is God's prophet. For Islam, the door to the true nature of humanity is the character of the prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. He is in son al Kamil, the complete man. He is the exemplar of, of our fitra, of the human form in its original nature as God created it. The love we Muslims feel for the Prophet has to do with the fullness of his humanity, not in any sentimental sense, but rather because in him is revealed an unfailing and providential capacity to bring out the full humanity of any and every situation and then act upon it. Whichever way you turn, there is the face of God, says the Quran. But it would be almost equally true to say, whichever way you turn, there is the example of the prophet. The essence of the Islamic view of the true human being, which is both the ideal we strive for and the norm according to which we are created, is unity of character, a unity that is indistinguishable from beauty. Whatever is unified is balanced. Whatever is balanced is well-proportioned. Whatever is well-proportioned is beautiful. The beauty of the prophet's character does not lie in an overwhelming brilliance or a blunt forcefulness or a beguiling fascination or terrifying majesty. The character of the prophet equally reflects all the names of God, with no one name predominating. It is this specific beauty, a beauty based on balance and unity, which makes him the norm and exemplar of the human state. The prophet was powerful and decisive in action, sometimes harshly rigorous in his pursuit of justice, as well as balanced and restrained. But he was not, in the Western sense, a man of action, a kind of Arab Napoleon. The prophet was affectionate to companions and family and merciful to enemies and to the needy and the oppressed, but he was neither a sentimentalist nor a philanthropist. The prophet was highly intelligent on both the spiritual and the social planes of reality, but he was not a genius. He was precisely a man. If we look for the more humble and ordinary aspects of human life, there they are. If we look for awe and trembling, 
Oh, excuse me, I missed, I missed something. He was precisely a man. If we look for spiritual exaltation in this man, we will find it. If we look for the more humble and ordinary aspects of human life, there they are. If we look for awe and trembling in the face of the terrible majesty of God, these two are in evidence. What we do not find, try as we may, are imbalance or irresponsibility or obsession or tyranny or cowardice or betrayal of trust or betrayal of self. This perfect adequacy of the prophet's nature to every perspective from which we view it, this lack of imbalance between the sublime and the mundane in his character, is the reflection in him of the Islamic doctrine that each name of God contains all the others. Some names are incomparably sublime, others apparently less so, but all are names of the one God, the one essence. In the Islamic view, humanity is both abd, God's slave, and Khalifa, God's fully empowered representative in this world. This is our fitra. And our central example of what it is to be Abd and Khalifa is the Prophet Muhammad. His submission to God was perfect, not because, like some of the greatest saints, he intensely desired to submit to God in a passionate and self-sacrificial way, but because he was one with the nature of things. And according to the nature of things, in the face of the absolute reality of God, the creature is as nothing. Whatever reality he has is a pure gift from the absolute reality, nor can he ever break out of or wander away from the sovereign will of God. Whether or not he submits willingly, he always submits actually. Muhammad knew this and therefore submitted willingly and perfectly. It was out of this perfect submission that he became the complete Khalifa of God. He was like a mirror turned to face all of God's names and attributes. The mirror itself does nothing and, as it were, is nothing. But it's because of this submission, this Islam, that all the forms of life can appear within it. The prophet was a shepherd, a businessman, a caravan leader, a contemplative, a warrior, a diplomat, a legislator, a judge, a ruler, a man of his clan and his family, a husband, a father, but he was not thereby a renaissance man, a person who seeks diversity of experience for its own sake, who develops and overdevelops many and diverse talents because he is basically in flight from his true nature and from the God who made him. He never departed from his center in order to develop this or that side or fragment of his character. His character was unified and beautiful because it reflected the unity of God. As Khalifa, Muhammad shows, showed a perfect balance between mercy and wrath. He mirrored the truth of God's nature expressed in the Hadith Qudsi, which is one of the traditions recounted in which Allah himself speaks. The Hadith Qudsi, my mercy takes precedence over my wrath. Perhaps this does not sound like a perfect balance, it's mercy takes precedence. But the truth is that mercy is the point of balance itself, while wrath is that which overcomes and balances and returns everything eventually to mercy. As Sayyid Hussein Nazar has said, the purpose of war is peace. Likewise, the purpose of the inevitable imbalances brought to us by life circumstances and our own psychology is to help us intuit our transcendent center of gravity the point within us yet beyond us known as the heart. In the words of the Hadith Qudsi, heaven and earth cannot contain me, but the heart of my willing slave can contain me. The heart is the light of God, the center of the human person. If the heart is like the sun, the virtues may be compared to the rays of the sun and to the many colors of the spectrum hidden in the sunlight. The character of the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, exhibits both the entire spectrum of virtues and the perfect balance between them, the synthesis of all the names of God known as the Mohammedan light, whose receptacle, destined as such from all eternity, is the human form. We develop character by practicing and realizing the virtues. The word virtue is related to the word virility. We used to talk about the virtues of herbs and stones, by which we meant their power to heal us, to make us complete. Virtue is power. It is the power to be 
who we really are, to attain and maintain the human state that God has commanded us to embody. The virtues are what allow us to live up to the amana, the trust God has placed upon us, which, as the Quran tells us, we as a race have willingly assumed. They are what allow us to be both abd, God's slave, and khalifa, God's fully empowered representative in this world, not only in our essential nature by which we are abd and khalifa from all eternity, but consciously and intentionally. Virtue, then, is the power that allows our intent to match our nature. There is no virtue, no name of God, that is not reflected in the character of the prophet. All virtues are Muslim, just as all virtues are Hindu or Jewish or Christian, Christian or Buddhist. But since every revelation of God is unique, Islamic virtue carries its own particular fragrance, which is unmistakable. The prophet of Allah manifested every virtue. We have neither time enough nor space enough to recount them all. This final lesson of the Covenants of the Prophet training course, which is the lesson on the uh, chivalrous virtues of the Prophet, as a way of internalizing our understanding of these covenants. Uh, this final lesson of the Covenants of the Prophet training course, however, is based on the virtues that most directly relate to Muhammad as, as a fata, a man of chivalry. The paramount fata chevalier or knight of Islam was, of course, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who wielded the fam famous double-pointed sword, Dul Fikar. As the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was the perfect mirror of Allah, so Ali was the perfect mirror of Muhammad. In him, all the virtues of the Prophet were fully displayed. Whenever Ali drew Dul Fikar, he battled the outer enemy with the first point and the inner enemy with the second. For him, the lesser jihad perfectly served the greater one, making it clear to all how the power of the Fatah on the field of outer warfare springs directly from his victories in the inner warfare on the field of the heart. I just want to add, Fatah means young man, you know, with the... Uh, connotation of heroic young man, young hero, but it's essentially exactly the same word um, as knight. Knight means heroic young man. And so um, the, uh, the path of the Fatah is called Futuwa in Arabic, which is usually translated as chivalry, and in, uh, uh, in Persian it's called uh, Javan, Mar, Javan Mardi, which means, you know, young manness, <laughs> youth, heroic youth. So, what makes, uh, I'm, I'm now 71 years old, so how can I speak of heroic youth in any relation to me? Well, there's something young in all of us. There's something willing to throw its life away or to, or to hold it precious, whichever God wishes. And I think this quality comes to the fore in um, adolescence, but it also comes to the fore in old age for similar yet opposite reasons. <laughs> so I will now end with four quatrains of Jalaluddin Rumi dedicated to the Prophet Muhammad based on the translations of A.G. Rawan Farhadi and Ibrahim Gamard and transcreated into poetic English by myself. I am the servant of the noble Quran as long as I draw breath. I am dust on the path of Muhammad, the chosen of God. If any man claims he's found something else in what I have written, I am disgusted with him and finished with him. A branch made of sugar sprang up. Suddenly the water of life welled up. The king poured alms into the hands of the poor. May joy and peace pour down upon the soul of Muhammad. The spirit once chained to mere ideas about God when the light of the chosen one shone upon it flew straight to his essence. The moment it took flight it cried out in its gladness, 
All blessings be upon the joyful spirit of Muhammad the Chosen. You made me the servant of Islam's travelers. You made me the bearer of certainty's trust. I am weak, I said, and your burden is heavy. You infused me in reply with iron and with power. <laughs>